Good morning, it's Andy Lombard, Executive Vice President at the Arizona Commerce Authority. Welcome everyone to our second uh, day of Small Business Boot Camps. We'll get started here in a few minutes as people start to uh, funnel in. Thanks for your patience and welcome and good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's Andy Lombard. Thank you for joining our Small Business Bootcamp this morning. Uh, we've got a great uh, subject today. We're going to do a lot of Q&A as we did yesterday. Um, we have a bunch of people joining in, so I want to give it a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll try to get started um, as close to 9 o'clock as possible. Thanks for your patience and good morning. Hey Mark, would you mind posting on the chat window the website location at ACA? Uh, it's within COVID, uh, business support, and then I believe webinars. Sure thing. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, you'll notice that we have a couple of uh, options to ask questions. We hope that you um, put your questions in the Q&A section, and you can start loading those in now, any questions that you might have. Uh, today, we're gonna go through uh, quick sources of cash. Um, we're also gonna do a very, very brief review of yesterday's information on PPP. Uh, Thomas Barr is joining us from Local First Arizona. Um, so we'll kick off um, with Thomas giving us a brief uh, update. Uh, also, we have Robert Theobald, um, our Director of Small Business here at the Arizona Commerce Authority, um, and he'll also be available. Um, we hope to um, have time, a lot of time at the end for a lot of questions, uh, both of the subject matter that Rand and Mike are gonna present to us today, as well as any other uh, questions on PPP. Uh, so stand by, we'll get started in about a minute or so, thanks. Okay, we just also in the chat window, you'll notice that uh, we've just posted um, the site where you can go and register for these. You do need to register for each one of the panels. Um, I know that that uh, takes a little effort and we will uh, we'll work on that, but um, bottom line is you have to register for each one of the day's panels. Again, we're gonna be doing daily panels um, uh, for the next six weeks um, and, and each subject matter will be published uh, in advance. Um, also for everyone um, joining the call, we, uh, we have a chat window. You can actually chat uh, any information uh, that's necessary. Also the Q&A. We hope that you use the Q&A section for questions. Uh, that would be um, most efficient for us. We'll really use that as the uh, Q&A section and we'll try to answer as many live questions as we can. Uh, the questions that we can't uh, get to or uh, need to do some research on, we'll um, publish on the site as well as address those um, outside of this uh, live Zoom. All of these um, sessions for the boot camps will be recorded. We're gonna be posting those up um, on a microsite that is under development right now by the Arizona Commerce Authority. We'll be publishing that site widely. Um, in addition, the um, slide decks and the content and resource information for every uh, one of our presentations will be posted up as well. Okay, I know there'll be more people joining, but in, in order to get through all of our topics today, we're going to join, uh, we're going to continue and uh, kick it off. Um, again, I'm Andy Lombard, Executive Vice President of the Arizona Commerce Authority. Uh, we're really happy and proud to stand up this small business boot camp. These are going to be daily touch points, daily sessions. Um, the way this runs is um, going to be Monday through Friday. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen really quick for you and we'll get... Uh, 
uh, to show you some of the details on it. Um, in addition to the boot camps, we are going to be um, collecting a, a bunch of resources and we're, we're referring to this as our resource collective with all of our partners. Um, we're really, really excited to be partnered with Local First Arizona and the Rural Development Group and also all of our SBDCs, uh, our universities, uh, fantastic, and all of the outreach uh, local partner groups. Uh, many, many others are involved and we're really thankful for that support. Um, and, and thank you for all of your um, um, leadership on that. The Small Business Bootcamp is designed to help prepare uh, small businesses of less than 20 employees to emerge from this crisis. Uh, it's a statewide initiative, again, supported by our community partners. We're gonna be running this daily for six weeks. We'll look at extending it if necessary. And we're also creating a resource collective as part of the Arizona Commerce Authority site. If you have not been there, azcommerce.com, just click on the top for COVID response. It's an unbelievable resource that gets updated multiple times a day. Uh, as part of that, we will have um, this information up on the site as well. Uh, yesterday, we dealt with PPP and idle uh, um, programming. We're gonna do a very, very quick review of that. I know that that is still on the mind of many of you. Uh, so we will uh, we'll do a quick review of that before we kick off today's session, which is sources of cash. Um, there are multiple ways that you can go boost your cash flow uh, from an increasing revenue perspective and other sources. So we're gonna start to tackle that and we'll be talking about that as we move forward in the future as well. I wanna remind everybody, um, our cadence is Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday will be new topics. Uh, those new topics will be uh, given in advance each week on Wednesday. Uh, we'll be broadcasting this out to the community uh, through email and our social networks, and it will be posted on our website, uh, specifically the site that's in the chat window now. Um, Thursday and Fridays are open office hours. Uh, we're gonna start this week with general Q&A and guidance uh, from our advisors as groups. Uh, we see this evolving into a multitude of uh, office hour sessions that can be um, uh, vertically oriented to each industry, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. But this week will be the larger group, um, Thursday and Friday, and answering any questions. And this can be any topics that, uh, uh, that come up. And again, if we have the answers, we'll, we'll answer those live. Um, we also have a process to codify all the questions um, from this uh, chat and from our Q&A section, and we'll be publishing those as well. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Thomas Barr. Thomas has been a, an incredibly great partner from Local First Arizona. Uh, Thomas is an expert on the PPP program as much as we can all be experts on a new program like this. Um, I've asked Thomas to give us a quick overview um, in the current um, status of the PPP uh, new rounds. Um, Thomas, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, just wanted to provide a quick update as um, there's lots of information coming out of news and media and everything, and we want to make sure that small businesses receive the most up-to-date, real-time information that we know that's happening. Um, so as of Tuesday, 9 a.m., just wanted to give a quick report out. So uh, for those of you that have been involved in following, you'll know that the PPP opened up its second round of submissions um, for those loans yesterday at 7.30 in the morning, um, hoping that many of you or all of you were able to get in an application before then. Um, the SBA reported that they received over 100,000 applications submitted through financial institutions across the country by 2 p.m. Um, and they, uh, you know, it was kind of slow going as it first started, uh, just within the first few minutes, it kind of froze up the system, but they got it moving afterwards and started getting, um, uh, those loans submitted, uh, locally here in Arizona, we know that there were, uh, many applications submitted. Um, for example, uh, we got numbers back from, uh, Prestamos, uh, CDFI who report is reporting out that they were able to submit. $5 million in PPP loans for over 140 businesses right here in the state. So um, I wanted to just note that there is some confusion going around right now among businesses being told that they cannot submit more than one application. And if they have that, it will slow down the process. 
Um, that is just simply not true. We have gotten word from um, the SBA and from the government, the federal government, um, stating that the SBA um, simply doesn't have the technology to really flag applications as they're coming through like that. Um, you just simply can't accept more than one PPP loan. So if you've put in an application with more than one financial institution, you don't need to worry that it's going to hurt your chances or um, be detected for fraud or uh, slow down the process for you at all. You can rest assured um, that if, if, if your application is approved with bank one and bank two, you'll just only be able to receive one of those. Um, so if you have not yet uh, applied for the loan, you can reach out to AZ Commerce Authority, reach out to Local First Arizona. We can direct you to um, digital financial technology companies that are still processing applications. Even Prestamos um, here locally, a CDFI is processing applications. So if you need assistance with that and have not applied yet or are concerned about waiting in the queue where you currently are, please reach out, let us be a resource, let us help you. Um, so we'll continue to update. You can follow Local First or Arizona Commerce Authority. Appreciate the partnership on updates as they happen by the hour and by the day um, as we learn more um, through the second round of funding. Thomas, thank you again. And again, thank you to you and Kimber at Local First Arizona. Um, just incredible partnership and leadership uh, through this time. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to transition now if we could um, and introduce uh, Rand and Mike, um, both from Mountain Mojo Group. Um, an incredibly cool marketing strategy website development uh, firm um, that has done some great work um, and we're excited to have them talk about uh, quick sources of cash. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Rand and Mike. Thanks guys. Thanks Andy. We appreciate you having us. Thanks Thomas. We appreciate the invite. Uh, longtime supporters of both organizations and longtime member of Local First for sure. Um, yeah, today we wanted to uh, try and cover a few different ways that um, you might be able to get some, some quick cash um, with some different avenues, whether it's marketing and or business development or sales, but just kind of a, more of a brainstorm. We're going to be going through a few of the items um, for some specific industries, but how it applies to your industry, please feel free to reach out in the comment or the chat um, section and ask questions there and we'll try and get back to you as quick as possible. Um, otherwise, we're going to kind of run through as much as we can as quickly as we can uh, to try and cover as many of these really cool ideas and really get a, a brainstorm going for, um, for some creative concepts that you might be able to apply as quickly as possible. Uh, real quick about us, we are a marketing agency out of Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, we specialize in everything from website to social, graphic design. Um, we do a lot of SEO, PPC, um, content, PR, pretty, pretty much a, a holistic agency. Um, so if you have marketing related questions, that's going to be right in our wheelhouse. Um, but we've also got Mike on, on the line here who's going to um, be helping us with, uh, he does a lot of our strategy. So he can help with a lot of different industries, with a lot of different types of revenue streams. Um, Mike, did you want to say anything before we get rolling? Yeah, I, I think you did a great introduction. I think uh, we've come up with a bunch of examples of some of the ways that we've seen other businesses handle the situation. And we're hoping that that inspires you to have a really creative, uh, productive brainstorm when it comes to you and your team. Perfect. Thank you. So we wanted to start off the presentation by uh, revisiting what, what we have. And so we've been working with our clients to really focus on, um, oh yeah, table of contents. So this are, these are a few of the things we'll cover today. Uh, we'll take a brief pause in between um, to try and get to some of the questions in the chat. But like I said before, we'll kind of move along from one to the other as, as efficiently as possible. Um, so the first slide we wanted to try and focus on um, uh, or just remind everyone that your pre-existing clients, those that you've been spending years and a lot of time and energy and resources to be able to, to get um, are probably the first place that we would recommend you starting. Um, when it comes to your customer base, um, reaching out to them right now is really important, but 
we're trying to encourage our clients to, to make sure that they're focused on uh, treating their customers right now like neighbors and less like customers. And so what we mean by that is um, in any of your social media posts, any of your outreach emails, whether or not you're um, sending out, uh, you know, different marketing messaging through different channels, we really want you to think about your customers like neighbors right now and not necessarily um, like uh, customers because they're not necessarily in buying mode. They're not in that buyer psychology. And yet at the same time, just a little bit of empathy and a little bit of um, care for them goes a really long way um, because that is what they need right now a lot more than they need whatever it is your goods and services are. Most likely they need a little bit of empathy as well. Um, we've seen, we've had some examples um, of people sending out e-blasts from ownership or um, leadership within an organization that really is just checking in on people, letting them know, you know, not necessarily what it is that you're doing um, internally, but really focusing on who that customer is and just making sure that they're doing okay. Another thing, if you are reaching out to, um, to your pre-existing customers is to let them know that your employees are okay and let them know that you're taking care of them and you're doing your best to be able to look after them um, again in an empathetic way. And then uh, treating your uh, store, if you have a brick and mortar and or um, however it is you deliver your services or products like a community um, so that when you're referring to your business, you refer to it as a part of the community, um, not necessarily as something that's separate or typically how we would represent it as a, a brand or an entity. Um, and then reviews, Mike added that on there. He had some really good um, perspective there. Yeah, thanks Rand. Uh, so people are more frustrated than ever. I'm sure a lot of us are not being able to get to our regular routines and the stores that we like and, and the products that we want. And so we've seen a large increase in negative reviews across every industry and it's not so much negative reviews, but people are just frustrated with the situation and they're taking it out wherever they can. And so we've seen it before, the most vocal you know, detractors are these reviewers and, and it's important right now to address them with empathy, like Rand was saying, with appreciation for their continued support, with solutions if they're asking for them and overall just to be thoughtful and patient with them and so I've included an example on the right side of this slide that I thought was just amazing where a customer had reached out, they were frustrated that they had visited a store where it didn't seem that they were using face masks. And we had a response from the COO of the organization explaining in detail all of the procedures that they've implemented and that you know it was up to the employees to wear a face mask because some employees had felt that they were touching their face to adjust the mask too much. And that for them had become a concern um, in spreading anything. So I, I just thought this was a great example. And Rand, did you wanna continue? Uh, yeah, just real quick to, to riff off of that. Uh, you know, addressing people's concerns when they do reach out um, obviously, we know that uh, there's a tremendous amount of fear and frustration, like Mike said. And so addressing the, the, that what they're feeling is real um, as quickly as possible, but then also pushing back a little bit and let, letting them know uh, that you're doing what it is that you can to be able to address their situation or their um, concerns within the constraints that you have uh, that this virus has given us all of us. So. And then circling back on the very bottom of that review, you'll notice that we um, had adjusted the, the actual um, deliverables for this client. And so now they do uh, curbside pickup. Now they do free delivery, which they hadn't in the past. And so trying to give um, your customers an alternative is uh, extremely important so that, you know, they know that you're going that extra step. Uh, a couple few or a few more things going down that list, speaking to essentials, uh, you know, it's a really bad time and it, it, we've seen a lot of messaging, um, mostly through social, but also through other marketing channels uh, where people are a little bit tone deaf. And so they're, you know, still trying to let people know that they're open, let people know that they should come by and, and buy things. Um, when in reality, people aren't um, uh, 
very engaged when it comes to people that are trying to sell things right now. So if you're in the business of, you know, if you have anything, services and or products that are essential and you are an essential business, really focusing on what those essentials are in your messaging and trying to stay away from what your typical cadence would be focused on, you know, different products and different services that you want to sell. Um, sticking to the basics. So a really good way to be able to get some content out if you don't have a whole lot of essentials or if you're not essential is letting them know what you do and what you do best, but in a really passive, really empathetic way, um, you know, like something simple, like, you know, here are our store hours or, you know, we're ready to open. And when we're, when we do open up, you know, these are the things this is how we're going to take care of you. Uh, another uh, easy way to be able to, um, reach out to your customers is, you know, just sharing community efforts. Very simple thing. There's a tremendous amount of people that have started a lot of these uh, little movements, uh, raising money for certain people that are affected. If you can find ways to donate gift cards to those efforts, if you can find ways to volunteer and support them, then throw those up on your social. It's a, it's a good way to let the community know that you are part of their community um, and that you're not always uh, trying to sell something. And then we were working with a realtor um, up in Flagstaff, a realty group. And, you know, it's not necessarily that we recommend you try to predict the future and that um, you're going to go out on a limb. But definitely, I think it's a really good time to put out information that is relevant to your industry and how it's been affected by this virus. But also a little bit more about, you know, what the future is going to hold. Um, I think that a lot of people, due to a tremendous amount of fear, are kind of in a reserved mode, and yet at the same time, they're not necessarily picturing what it's going to be like when we all come out of this. And so if you can paint that picture and paint your industry, your service, your product in that picture, um, it's a really good way to kind of get a little ahead of them when it comes to your branding efforts. I think we're ready, Mike. Yeah, and I had one example on here of... Uh pulling an ad. And I like this example because KFC had been running this it's finger looking good ad. And that just feels a little bit insensitive. And so they pulled that ad uh, recently. And so this is a little bit what we're talking about. We have had to shift a lot of our strategies and just pull ads that we felt were just a little bit insensitive and replace them with something that just addressed the point, the points that Rand had mentioned. And so it's important to reflect on what's out there that we're already putting out there and see if it's maybe not prescient at the moment. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. And Adidas, I don't know if you guys caught that, but Adidas um, sent out an email saying that they were going to keep their stores open and they were going to social distance and really quickly the backlash got out of control. And so then they had to follow up with a, a statement saying that they, their employees are more important than their bottom line. Um, and so just being sensitive about those things. Okay, uh, some of our favorite topics um, when we come into digital marketing. So yes, assuming that you know, you've know you now messaged to your customer base that you have, um, how do you go and get new customers? How do you try and uh, find different ways to be able to adjust to the situation? And Mike, I'll let you take over a little bit here. So we've obviously had to shift a lot of the strategies with many of our clients. And to do that, we've had to think creatively about what they can offer, especially for many of them that aren't essential. And so for retailers that are essential, I think uh, it's important to focus on pickup and delivery. People are not wanting to leave their homes or I'm seeing a lot of the um, curbside pickup where they you know, pop your trunk and they just throw it in. That's great. People are really appreciating that, you know, the low contact shopping. Uh, office equipment, there's a bunch, been a bunch of retailers that are booming in the office equipment space. And that's not just office equipment, uh, like furniture. It's also accessories, webcams, uh, desk accessories, mouse pads, keyboards, anything that people need to get set up to work from home. And in addition, food delivery, essential items, um, obviously, you know, We've seen some restaurants who are including toilet paper rolls in their takeout bags, and that has the right flavor to really connect with the community. And um, people are ordering just to get the TP. Uh, in addition, hobby stuff, people have been spending a lot more time on their hobbies, you know, when they've been furloughed or just spending time at home, spending time with their family. And so we found that uh, people selling hobby kits, puzzles, uh, 
coloring books, do DIY kits have all done really well with, with many of our clients. And that's something that if you can offer it, people are, are looking right now. Um, as far as professionals, I think this is fairly obvious given that we're on the Zoom call right now. Streaming webinars, web training, web conferences uh, have exploded online. And I'm seeing a lot of people who I previously thought were very shy are now doing wildly successful web conferences and getting out there and signing up new clients. And I'm thinking in particularly of a running coach who we've been working with. And they told me they've been signing a new client every single week, 100% remote, which is totally inspiring for me. And I think that can be repeated, not just for personal trainers, for lawyers, for uh, consultants. When Mike, it comes to, yep. Can you jump in real quick? So back to the hobby stuff. We did have a few clients um, that are in the retail space, um, either e-commerce or you know, brick and mortar, uh, who have started to package things. And so that's another alternative um, you know, to try and get your uh, average revenue per ticket up is to try and throw together four or five things um, for somebody to do. And so you know, if you are in that space where you can offer um, things for people to cook or things for people to do or things for children to learn, um, you know, it's a good idea to try and, you know, instead of trying to offer four or five normal things to put four or five things together, you know, put some different prices on there and try and sell as a package. Um, we're working with a, a hardware store up in Flagstaff. You can see that picture there, um, you know, where it's one thing to sell gardening products. It's another thing to sell a, a raised bed garden package, um, you know, and what would typically be a 30 or 40 or $50 delivery um, you know, now they're averaging over a hundred dollars per delivery. So um, consider packages too. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I thought that's a great addition. And in a later slide, we'll uh, talk a little bit about doing videos. And so we've done some videos demonstrating the DIY packets and those have done really great on social as well. Um, in addition, when you're getting on digital, promoting your brand right now, it's a great time to promote your brand, especially if you're really tuned in to what's going on in people's lives. And I, and I think especially the empathy part, we see a lot of success recently and you know, for a long time actually with these selfie videos, really low, low production value with a lot of personality. We're getting the founders and the managers of the business, the employees of these businesses, holding up that phone and walking through their daily life, talking to their fans on Facebook. And it has a real high impact in the local community. Um, up here in Flagstaff, I know people walk into these restaurants and businesses and say, oh, I saw you on Facebook. And that's exactly the type of local community connection that we like to foster that builds a brand and it has people choosing your local business over the national retailer down the, down the road. Um, Mike, so, can I jump in one more time? Um, probably a lot more times. Um, and, and so just uh, real quick marketing basics, uh, when what we tell our clients is, you know, half the time you're going to be selling conversion based, you know, you want somebody to click on something, you want them to call. Um, and the other half the time we really want a brand, you know, we want to be able to get your vision and your mission and your logo and your colors and your fonts, um, out there to the world to let them know who you are and why you do what you do. And so to, to if you are not ha if you don't have customers right now that are converting because you're not able to convert them, now is a fantastic time to be able to brand. Really push your brand and really push that, that message behind the brand itself. Yeah, and, and so um, I like to think of branding as being really important as a touch point and longer sales cycle products and services. Um, it's obviously important with, with shorter sales cycles as well. But when we're talking about a six month cycle where someone has to be, you know, approached multiple times, those branding ads can have a larger effect by creating a touch point in between your emails, creating a touch point in between your conferences, creating a touch point in between seminars, sales calls and all that stuff. And it, and it gives you a chance to just be empathetic, to get your message out there about what your mission and values are during a pandemic. Um, in addition, it's a great time to get a deal on ads on Facebook, on social media right now. Uh, a lot of the industries, a lot of competitors are pulling back on what they're spending. And I understand if they have a short sales cycle, if their business is closed, that's, you know, it might make sense to do that. Well, at the same time, we are not recommending that at all. We're shifting strategies, not ad budgets. 
We're shifting messaging, not ad budgets, and we're getting a lot higher ROI on those ads when it comes to branding, when it comes to views. And so the $200 that we're spending last month has gone twice as far this month. And the engagement that we're seeing online has gone twice as far. And so we're seeing a viral effect that we normally don't see because people are spending more time on social media, spending more time sharing. And so when we look at this graphic to the right, we're seeing uh, how people in each age group are spending their time during quarantine. And up at the top, searching for coronavirus and COVID-19 updates, I think that's fairly obvious. And then immediately below that, we have listening to music, watching movies and shows, watching funny and videos, playing games on mobile, looking at memes. All of those are captured by social media. And so that's where people are spending their time in a big way. And so getting on those platforms means meeting them where they are. Yeah, and that's a, a good point, Mike, is they're in entertainment mode. They're not necessarily logging on to learn something new. They're not logging on to uh, shop for a product. Um, they're logging on to be able to be entertained. And so when you, I take that back, they are logging on to learn th new things. Um, but, they, but they're logging on um, to be entertained. And so if you can curate content that's, that is a little bit more entertainment based and a little less salesy, um, you're gonna, it's gonna go a really long ways. So it, uh, that's a great point, Rand. It didn't make it into our slides because we can't fit everything in, but when we're building content for social, really shareable content, trying to hit the three E's, which are educational, emotional, and entertaining. In what order, that's up to you. But if it's hitting those three E's, then people are going to like and share it. Flipping to the next slide. So a lot of the businesses that we're working with are offering new services, a, a, an essentially a revenue pivot, something they hadn't done before. And we're seeing a lot of creative ways that they're doing this. And hopefully some of these ways can inspire you to come up with some ideas for your own business. In particular, I was, uh, I was impressed by El Chase Steakhouse. And so they've had some media written about them. Uh, they're in Chicago and famous steakhouse becomes a butcher shop and they're selling sides and they've been promoting it on social media like crazy. And uh, it's become a hot topic in Chicago, them offering these amazing cuts of beef that are usually not available at your deli counter or regular butcher shop. Uh, in addition, drive-in theaters is a popular one. We've seen some examples here in Arizona, the Verde drive-in setting up and some movie theaters becoming outdoor drive-ins and some ranches becoming outdoor drive-ins. I've seen a lot of examples of this one. I think it's popular because it gets people out of their home and into a community space and it just feels a little bit normal. Uh, Shake Shack, I, you know, they've had some good and bad press about them recently. And I think uh, this DIY burger kit is probably some of the best press they've gotten. They came out with this almost immediately when quarantine went, went into effect and along with a, an advertising campaign that you can make the Shack burger at home uh, along with instructions and it went viral relatively quick online. There's lots of people, YouTube stars, uh, Instagrammers, TikTokers who have filmed themselves putting together one of these kits. And so that has helped them gain traction with their takeout business uh, during the quarantine. Uh, Rand, do you wanna talk about Hound? You bet. And I don't know if Thomas um, has a, a moment, but uh, he had shared this, that the, they, the, this Hound app has a voucher program, you know, a buy now, visit later uh, voucher program. And so we linked that in here for you to have as a resource. Um, Thomas, did you want to say anything about them at all? Yeah, just, just really quick. Um, Hound is a digital platform for small businesses who rely on foot traffic to participate in a program to um, have their customers purchase vouchers that they can use later so you can get cash infused into your business now. So it's great for restaurants, bowling alleys, entertainment, um, arts and cultural organizations like museums, um, salons, barbers, yoga studios, fitness studios, places that can't have people come to them right now. Um, you can participate in the platform um, and have cash infused into your business. We've heard from restaurants 
um, that have had up to $3,000 into their business in just a few days after participating. So we'll make sure that this link gets sent out to everybody for sure. Awesome. That's great. And I just got a well, Cameron, good big shout out for you to getting out of your comfort zone. And then Patricia had a question about um, massage hands-on. That is definitely an industry that's been crushed. And so um, some of our friends up in Flagstaff, we've been working with them to try and get uh, some DIY videos going so that they can go from, um, from healer to teacher as quickly as possible. Um, you know, encouraging people to, um, you know, everybody's kind of sitting around all day. And if there's ways that uh, you can show them um, uh, small tips, uh, breathing, stretching, um, how to massage one another, those types of things. Um, you know, with short videos, we try and tell people to keep the videos as short as possible. Um, but there are simple ways to do it, you know, with just iPhones nowadays and a, a little microphone that you can buy uh, online. So that's a, that's a really good question. Yeah, I think Rand's really got a point. It does not have to be high production value. People are not looking out for that right now. So don't be shy. Put out what you have with what is your personality. And I think uh, I'm, I use massages. So uh, the, qu the question asker was asking about their massage business. And I was thinking, oh man, how I could use a hand massage. If someone would put a video out, how to give myself a hand massage, they would be, I would be thanking you at the end of the day after I'm done on my keyboard. Um, so maybe that's an idea. And what's this whole new business, the drive-in at Schnepp Farms? Is this also a drive-in theater? Yeah, Thomas had, had mentioned them um, being in Phoenix and, and transitioning a farm into a drive-in, and that's just a really great out, outside-of-the-box concept. Uh, other new services we've seen in Arizona, a lot of the distilleries and breweries in, in Arizona in Arizona have shifted to producing hand sanitizer, and that's been great for their PR. Uh, I've seen Doug Ducey tweeting about all of the distilleries pulling together and changing their production line to producing hand sanitizers. Really proud of those businesses for doing that. Uh, also the Changing Hands bookstore offering care packages. And this is not just books, it's other tchotchkes and, and treats from their store. And that's a bit like the care package that you might get if you were at college and mom was sending it to you. And people are really appreciating that thoughtful touch and especially the people who go to Changing Hands and shop the aisles and spend time there reading books uh, are missing it. And so this gives them a chance to dive into that experience coming out of a care package box. Mike, uh, that's a really good point. We have had some uh, clients out of Sedona where they're focused on, on um, sending just cards, just greeting cards out to their customers, checking in on them, um, you know, a small touch point because their uh, clients and customers have put them on pause or they're, you know, they're waiting this thing out to be able to use them. And so um, in such a sensitive time when uh, emotions are heightened, uh, just something as simple as a card in the mail to you know, some, some big important uh, customers of yours, um, is, it goes a really long way. And those are, the, those are the things that people are gonna remember coming out of this. And so hopefully sooner than later, um, when you do start back up, they're going to be uh, long-term customers of yours. Thanks, Rand. Uh, Another great example that is just so inspiring for me on social media are, is Joe Wicks and other fitness instructors. Um, for me, them bringing their positive attitude and their energy to social media has been huge for me during quarantine, and I think it is for everybody else. Joe is just one success story. I've seen a lot of these. And in six weeks, he's gained 35 million views for his online personal training videos on YouTube, which just blows everybody out of the water, but I've seen some small personal trainers in Texas uh, doing growth as well. Some running coaches here in Flagstaff, like I said before, signing new clients every week. And just that positive message, their energy, their consistency, helping people and encouraging them to stick with their, their fitness goals um, throughout this difficult time has just been a source of strength for the community. And, and so um, I encourage you, if you're in, in that business, to start putting out videos like that and start being that energy for people on those platforms. And then in addition, another big retailer, I was really happy to see New Balance um, 
had started, had changed their production lines to be producing masks. And they also had a big boon of PR. We've seen a lot of uh, small local businesses doing this as well. Up here in Flagstaff, uh, we have some, I think they're called cash bags, these armored cash bag companies that sew like metal bags to, to preserve their you know, food from outdoor critters. And they've switched their whole production line, um, got all new sewing facility. And so now their sewers are all producing masks and PPE. And so it's just been super cool to see, you know, businesses doing that and then to gain the attention for that and to, you know, get recognition from their representatives and the government and from people in the community. And, you know, right now they're not selling, but their impact once they start selling their product again is going to be huge because I'm seeing their likes grow on Facebook. I'm seeing their uh, attention grow from government, from community, from the media, and they're paying it forward in a way that's going to pay them back. Mike, we're going to try and run through these next few slides really quick. It looks okay. like we got in the weeds a little bit too quick. Um, so I will uh, do that really quick, Andy. Um, yeah, just we mentioned it before. People are changing the way they consume, um, you know, videos on social media, streaming music ads, uh, adding new content to all sorts of things, preferably relevant content. If you've got something, you know, if you're a realtor, how is uh, COVID-19 affecting the real estate market in my area? Um, and then Zoom and web conferencing, which I'm sure that a lot of you have seen um, the million DIY videos that are coming out with how to, how to use Zoom. Um, Mike, next slide. We'll run through these pretty quick. Uh, cost savings. We just wanted to make sure since we started the, the um, presentation with retention that we also focused on cost savings. So um, if you are going remote uh, or if you're thinking about going remote, you know, obviously that's going to reduce overhead office space utilities um, and that's going to save you some money, which puts more cash in your pocket. Um, incorporating uh, new processes. So if you are brick and mortar, getting that e-commerce site up as quickly as possible. Um, new subcontractor workforce. So uh, if you are going remote and you have people that can't go, can't be remote, uh, there are uh, things like Upwork, um, which you can visit, and that will um, give you uh, op or, uh, access to subcontractors. You know, obviously, new products and services we've been talking about, um, doing less with more, challenging your team to see whether or not they have ways that you can save money. Uh, if you have weekly check-ins with them, that's a really good way to do that. Renegotiating vendor agreements. A lot of people are hurting right now, and so people are open um, to helping one another. Uh, strategic partnerships, obviously always important. And then um, the reduced commute time uh, by yeah. not going anywhere. Mike, do you, can we go to the next? Yeah, I just wanted to thematically, you know, loop this back. You know, uh, we've seen some questions in the chat about how this relates to quick cash. And I say, you are still a business today. You are still selling. We would like to encourage you to try a, a pivot um, if you're not already offering essential services or services online or via Zoom, the, the point of this presentation is to help you come up with a toolkit, a creative brainstorm session, ideas and inspirations so that you can keep selling, so that you can increase sales, so you can find a new revenue stream, so that you can promote it, so you can come up with messaging to promote it, and so that you can resonate with your customers right now so that they will come back again when things have returned to normal. That's great, guys. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, let's go to some of the questions. I think there's a few in the Q&A left, and we can also just really quickly um, put everyone's attention into the answered questions, too. You can see the uh, written answers. There's some really good links and good information there. Um, let's open it up for uh, more questions, but um, if you guys want to just uh, tackle some of these real quick, and then also encouraging PPP questions. We have our PPP experts on, too. Um, as a follow-up from yesterday's meeting, so we can uh, open that up as well. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Douglas, I don't know if we could focus directly on your industry or if you have any specific questions, but what we were trying to do is really just get the, the creative juices flowing and get some brainstorms on, okay, I sell this, I can't sell this because of COVID-19, what else can I sell? Um, try and get that quick cash in as 
or, you know, any sort of cash, you know, multiple revenue streams in as quickly as possible. Yeah, the gift cards also, I think, is a huge uh, pre-sale process. If you can sell your goods in advance, that's, a, that's an awesome strategy as well. Yeah, and I see Laura's question about travel businesses. We work with a lot of travel businesses, and they have been hit incredibly hard. Uh, the Flagstaff community has been hit really hard because of so much of the community relying on travel and tourism business. And so one thing that we found besides having to deal with the mass cancellations and having to deal with those cancellation calls with empathy and patience um, is that people are still planning. The average, the average sales cycle for a longer trip is around 55 days. And so people are still sort of thinking that this might be over in about 50 days, 45 days. And so they are spending time on travel websites uh, looking at what the vacation they might do after this quarantine is over. I know I'm one of them. I need a vacation once this is over with. And so if we can spend this time sorting through the video that we've produced or sourcing video from our previous customers, we've seen that be relatively successful asking, you know, previous customers to send us the video and then stringing it together into, you know, a nice social media travel montage uh, has kept the interest up in these travel businesses while people can't visit. Yeah, like I said before, we're trying to paint that picture of people um, and what it would be like if they were on vacation, but pick, paint that picture now. And then the other quick thing is uh, deals. Everybody's looking for a deal right now, whether or not they should buy stocks, whether or not they should buy that plane ticket, whether or not they should book something. Um, so if you have some sort of a deal that lets them know, you know, book in the fall, you can cancel if you want. Uh, or, you know, you can cancel a month out if it doesn't work out kind of a thing. Um, you might be able to get some some cash in pretty quick. Uh, that's a great answer, Rand. I'm seeing another question about apprenticeships. Uh, I think, I don't know the specifics of your business, Lynn. I think apprenticeships can be done online. A lot of training can be done online. Of course, you can't do a lot of technical machinery related stuff uh, online, but we're going to see a lot of businesses increase what they're doing as far as training via video. Um, and we, we've done that as well. And those processes will stick around once this quarantine is over. We'll see that people who have produced training videos for apprenticeship programs are going to continue to use those training videos in place of in-person training or in, in supplement to in-person training. And that'll improve their process and efficiency long-term. Uh, Andy, I see a, a, a message from you or a question from you about the hospitality industries with third parties. Uh, I don't know if this is specific to you, but if it, um, we know that we've had some issues with uh, folks going through Airbnb and some other things, and, and we've um, given them the advice of going to their credit card company and asking them to do chargebacks, and that's kind of taken some of the heat off of the smaller businesses that are... Um, that are struggling with these big third parties that have just made huge sudden shifts or stops in their business. Uh, I have another question here from Chaz about lead generation via social media. I think Chaz, if you're doing any kind of outreach and lead generation or engagement on social media, I'm thinking especially LinkedIn or Facebook, then it's important to just stay empathetic, lead with how are you, rather than what do you need, how can I help you, is probably gonna be the way that you're gonna, that'll probably be the way you're gonna put the most people off trying to sell hard to them um, during the pandemic. Also leading with value, us doing this conference call today is, is an example of that. If you can lead with value by pointing people towards the resources that they need, then even if they're not a lead today, they're gonna to engage with you again once this is all over and they're back in the buying mode. Yeah, that's a great point. There's a question on Hound. I don't know if you guys specifically have used the platform, but I think there was a data question and can you see a participating list of businesses? For the, the Hound voucher program, I did see that. Um, we're not terribly familiar with that. I don't know whether or not you have to join, but I'm sure you could send them a note, Thomas. I can, I can take that one, Ryan. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, I'm seeing a question from Andy about guests wanting to check in early. Yeah, so for I, the Hound platform. Oh, I'm sorry. Please keep going. Sorry, 
Thomas, were you going to hit that? Okay. Oh, I think we, we must have lost Thomas. Yeah, um, I had seen a question about early check-ins in hotels. And this is another one of those where pe when people are traveling, especially during quarantine, they are extra frustrated um, and extra impatient. And so, again, you know, giving extra training to front desk staff to be super empathetic and phone answering to be super empathetic and patient with those people. Um, I think if you can store luggage earlier in the day and wait for a late check-in, that is probably one of the most immediate strategies that you could implement rather than switching up the way and how you schedule cleaning, um, but allowing people to drop off their luggage and leave it there and, and then come back later for a more uh, appropriate check-in time uh, is my immediate yeah. thought. Andy, whenever you have a customer that's frustrated, always start with acknowledging that it's real, what they're feeling is real, what's, what's going on. And that typically puts them in a, a much better position for you to communicate uh, facts instead of uh, having an emotional conversation. And uh, Mike, just a riff off of, I can't remember what the other, there was a, these are, these are coming so quickly. Um, oh, geez. So social media, I, I did want to follow up. Really quick tip, if you're sitting down with your friend at dinner, you haven't seen them in a while, um, you know, what are you gonna talk about? What are you gonna bring up? And if it's not that interesting and you're not, don't put it on social media. And so, you know, when you're trying to get into this mindset of I'm gonna DM some folks on social media, again, what would you say to your friends if you were just sitting down at dinner with them versus what are you trying to sell them? That's great. Um, Hey guys, I want to shift a little bit. I know that there have been some questions or at least there's uh, PPP still on uh, people's mind. Um, it is current. Um, I know that we have um, a few of our experts on the phone. Um, Tom Fulcher, is there any new information? I know that Thomas had uh, provided us a quick update. I, I would like to see if you have uh, any information to share. So nothing drastically new. I know 100,000 loans uh, were pushed through uh, to the SBA yesterday as of about four in the afternoon. Um, and banks and everyone and lenders are still you know, trying to process PPP as rapidly as possible. There were some initial SBA site traffic issues and the SBA is working through that. Okay, uh, we have a couple of S uh, PPP questions in the um, Q&A section, Tom, if you could handle that one from Maria, or I'm sorry, Marie. Uh, yeah, I see the one from Evelyn before that, so I can answer that. Evelyn, um, you know, you say that you work most of the contracts, but you don't qualify for PPP. You actually do. Uh, you can't claim the contractors as part of your payroll, but you as a, an owner can claim yourself as part of your payroll. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know uh, some of you, you've had some relationships over at the SBDC. I'd encourage you to call them, Evelyn, and, and get their assistance. Uh, Marie has asked... Uh, if an employee does not want to come back, but you've received a triple P loan, can you replace them? Um, and the answer is this is about jobs, not individual names. So yeah, you can, it's, on, it's about jobs. So if you get a new job, that's fine. Um, you can replace that person. Uh, a tough one from, uh, let's see. Hey, Did Tom. It, yeah, go ahead. Tom. <laughs> Can nonprofits qualify? I think that's qualified for PPP. We get that a lot. Go ahead and answer that. Uh, yes, yeah, and so um, you know, not certain nonprofits can qualify. There's a few rules around there. Charity versus nonprofit. Um, you can look it up in the interim final rule with the SBA. Contact the SBA, and uh, if I mentioned the SBDC before, they are helping nonprofits as well as businesses in this process. You can certainly reach out to them for assistance. Yeah, Gail, also, if you can look at the answers for the Q&A, uh, Robert has published a, uh, an excellent answer on that and a link for you. And Tom, I, we were talking to our CFO a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, we had a couple people that left, right, as we applied for the PPP, and we had replaced them with subcontractors for a little while. And apparently this, the CFO or our CFO said that that would qualify um, so maybe if somebody did lose somebody, but they're not unable to hire that quickly, do you think that would, would work? It doesn't. 
uh, subcontractors, okay. independent contractors, you know, basically 1099s do not count. Um, can, any independent contractor needs to get their own PPP. Uh, so as a company, you know, it may be practical that you need to replace them with a contractor in order to keep moving, mm -hmm. uh, but it won't uh, apply for the loan as usage of the loan, uh, nor as forgiveness. You can use the economic injury disaster loan to pay subcontractors, uh, but that is not a forgivable loan. Got it. Thank you. Absolutely. Tom, a few more in there on the Slack, or I'm sorry, on the Q&A, if you could do that, please. Um, yep. Um, you know, as far as reaching out to any specific bank, uh, unfortunately, you know, we don't have a specific contacts because you'll need to find out who your actual banker assigned to your file is. Uh, so I can't really help with that one. And every lender works a little differently. A uh, colleague applied the uh, day before you and received their grant money, hasn't been contacted yet about the loan. Um, that is a typical thing we're hearing the advances and it was always designed that way do go out prior to everything else and we are hearing that uh, some people applied under the early process and they had an application started with a two have actually received loans before talking to their case manager those whose confirmation number started with a three um, are should be awaiting for word from the case manager to, to complete their loan pack application As far as uh, what's the turnaround once a loan application is sent by the banks, uh, once you have an SBA loan number, which is a 10 digit number, eight digits, hyphen two more digits. So think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, hyphen nine, zero. Once you have a loan application number that's been approved, check with your bank. The indications in the interim final rule from the SBA said that you have to be funded within 10 days. In most cases, uh, most people I'm hearing have gotten that loan approval number are getting their funding more rapidly than that. Uh, a friend said that she didn't, the bank said she didn't qualify for a loan because she and her daughter do draws. Um, well, actually, there is a whole set of rules around uh, self employed, and self employed is a very varied area. Uh, you might be a Schedule C, you might uh, be some other form of self-employed. Uh, draws are not what's looked at for the self-employed. Self-employed, it's a combination of actual payroll that you pay yourselves and net earnings. And uh, that is still subject to the $100,000 per individual cash salary cap. So you, you do apply. Um, I'd encourage you if you've got a bank telling you that, that you maybe you check the wrong box on the application, um, you know, reach out for assistance and, uh, you know, you can always go to the SBA and pull their interim final rule down and demonstrate that to them, but you do, you do qualify. Hey, Tom, there's also on the link that I posted uh, that I shared at the home.treasury.gov, there's a great tool they have under there under the borrower section for independent contractors and sole proprietors on how to figure out how much you can apply for um, based on those things you just shared on on what you're paying yourself and what your your income is. Um, so um, if you're an independent contractor or sole proprietor, take a look at the borrower section um, under the home.treasury.gov link that I shared. Robert, go ahead and share that on the, uh, the chat for all uh, participants as well, thanks. Yep. Got time for a couple more, Tom, if you want to. Uh, there's a sure. disaster loan um, limit of 25,000. Quick answer on that. Uh, disaster loan limited to just no. There are three types of loans. There's an a express bridge loan. That is a $25,000 loan. Uh, the idle loans are to uh, $2 million. And the triple P loans are to $10 million. So there are various types of loans. That's not an issue. Um, can you clarify the SBA gives you 60 days to hire back your employees? So the way that we're told it works is that the day everything starts is the day you get dispersal of your funds. Um, and so over eight weeks, if you don't hire your employees back for four weeks, then you will potentially lose four weeks worth of that forgiveness. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, Andy, someone asked if companies 
attained PPP loans are going to be made public. I have no idea on that one, so we can put that on the list of- Yeah, let's put that on our um, research list. There's one also from James Bates, if you can answer that one on the chat, is for forgiveness. If you reach 75% with salaries, you still need to document uh, for the 25%. Perfect. Yes, James, you, you need to document everything. Um, and the, one of the requirements is that at least 75% is paid toward payroll. And you'll want to look carefully at what defines payroll because it's not just salary, uh, but it's you know other forms of compensation. In fact, a question was out to the SBA recently about people give housing allowances, and that's cash compensation that counts. The other 25% is uh, utilities, uh, mortgage interest, and rent paid by the company, and that can make up the other 25%. It can't exceed that, but you do need to track all of it. And if you're self-employed, general advice I've heard is, you know, make sure you're paying yourself a salary during that eight week period so you have trackability on it. Hey, Tom, while we're breaking for a second here, I wanted to um, uh, go ahead and thank Rand and Mike. That was really awesome information. And I wanna put it in context of the concept that we have of this boot camp. It's daily. Uh, we're gonna refresh these topics as we move along. We know that a lot of people are thinking about PPP and the idle programs. Um, those will continue as we start to uh, discuss that over the next week or so. Uh, but we wanna transfer people into that uh, very, very important uh, recovery and planning phase uh, of their business. And I love the comments that have been made about we are still in business and we wanna make sure that people are focusing on those activities. Um, again, we're, we're looking at respond plan and restart. And that's a super important activity. And as we start to move these um, uh, boot camp subjects and topics along, there's going to be a lot of information on planning and restart. This is a great um, pre-session on the marketing side, as well as uh, those areas of quick cash will continue to focus on that. So Rand and Mike, thank you so much. Um, you've got a great organization there on Mountain Mojo Group and hope you uh, continue to work with us as we move forward too. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Um, I just want to um, just briefly remind everybody, um, go to our website. Um, there's such great resources as well as, the, as um, you go through the SBDCs, uh, which we're partnering with, um, Arizona Work for Workforce, um, and of course, our manufacturing MEP programs too. Um, Arizona Commerce, uh, azcommerce.com. You go to the COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, site. We have a bunch of resources there. We'll continue to post up these informations. Um, and as well, I want to remind everybody tomorrow, if you have not registered for the next session, this is going to be um, a great session, um, engaging with your banks and considering alternative funding sources. We will, again, recap and have experts available on the PPP program and other questions. That's kind of the theme that we're going to continue to move forward with, uh, at least for this week and some into next week. Uh, but engaging with your banks has been so critical. Um, uh, we want to make sure people are planning on that as well and looking at alternative funding sources, not just the PPP programs as well. That is tomorrow. Those links are on our site, uh, which have been posted. We'll post those up one more time. And then uh, Tom, um, Tom, Thomas, Robert, uh, if you could go ahead and uh, continue and if there's any other quick questions that we can answer in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, I see a couple real quick, Andy, I'll answer. And I'll, I'll say that I also see we have some uh, folks from the Arizona's SBDC have joined us on this workshop, definitely reach out to them. They're, you know, statewide and um, can help. Uh, Carolyn asked about health insurance. So if you have group health insurance, that is part of the compensation. That's part of your 75%. Uh, so that does qualify. Um, Suzanne posted that, you know, the SBA is unable to accept new applications. Uh, yes, they had initially announced that they'd be accepting idle applications yesterday, but that is not open yet. Uh, a friend attended a workshop with uh, one of the local SBA officials, and they did not have a projection on exactly when that would be open, but it is expected to be open soon. Um, then we had someone ask about the criteria for triple P approval and hasn't heard back. Um, well, the criteria, and we kind of covered that yesterday. I'd encourage you to look at the uh, ACA website. Andy, do you know when yesterday's uh, webinar will be published? It already is published. It's posted up there. Um, so go ahead and take a look at that. There's valuable information regarding all the criteria, the entire new program uh, that's been announced too with the PPP. So 
um, valuable information. And we can also um, cover more Q&A on Thursday and Friday on our open office hours too. So please uh, planning on joining us on Thursday and Friday for those open office hour Q&As. With that, we're gonna wrap up. Uh, we will be logging these questions in. Um, we are uh, creating a microsite uh, on the AZ Commerce uh, uh, site. Um, right now, we've given links to where the um, uh, these will be posted up. These uh, sessions will be posted up, but we'll have a separate site uh, probably by the end of this week. Uh, so we look forward to that. Again, I want to thank um, uh, Mike and Rand. Great job. Uh, really uh, fantastic information. Um, really starts getting us thinking about what that next transition and how we start to think about um, creating our momentum going forward. We want to make sure everyone um, has that information as we start to, uh, you know, move from that recovery to plan phase is, is where we're at and then hopefully moving quickly into the restart uh, so we can all get to uh, back to where we were and thriving. So again, thank you everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, Local First Arizona for sponsoring today and uh, Tom Robert for your expertise on the PPP and our small business programs. With that, we will close out. Thank you everyone. Appreciate your, uh, your time today. We'll leave the chat open, provide us feedback if you can. Um, also on topics of interest that you might have coming up, uh, what uh, areas that you need help with, we'll start to uh, uh, codify the resources to help you um, with that. So thank you again. Uh, we'll keep this open for a little bit, but thanks guys.